What happens when a man's life hangs in the balance, with only days left before a scheduled execution? Today, we dive deep into a case that challenges our understanding of justice, mercy, and redemption. Welcome to The Real Crime Diary, Daily Dose of Crime. I'm Sean Dupree, and today we're exploring the compelling story of Richard Moore, a death row inmate in South Carolina whose fate rests in the hands of one person, the governor. In a state that has never granted clemency to any of its 44 executed inmates since 1976, Moore and his supporters are fighting for his life with just hours remaining. But what makes this case different from all the others? What transformed a convenience store robbery gone wrong into a two-decade journey that has touched the lives of prison officials, jurors, and even the original trial judge? Let's turn back the clock to September 1999, in Spartanburg, South Carolina. What started as a routine transaction at a local convenience store would spiral into a deadly confrontation that would forever change the lives of two families. According to the official record, Richard Moore entered the store that fateful day, looking to make a purchase. But there was a problem he was 12 cents short. What happened next remains a matter of fierce dispute, with two very different versions of events. Moore's account paints a picture of an argument that escalated rapidly. He claims that after the dispute over the shortage, store clerk James Mahoney pulled out a gun. In the ensuing struggle, Moore says he managed to wrestle this first weapon away, only to find himself facing a second gun in Mahoney's hands. During the chaotic exchange that followed, Moore was shot in the arm. He then fired back, striking Mahoney in the chest with what would prove to be a fatal shot. But this wasn't the end of the incident. After the shooting, Moore went behind the counter and took approximately $1,300 from the store. This detail would later prove crucial in shaping both the prosecution's case and public perception of the events. What makes this case particularly unique in South Carolina's death row history is that Moore entered the store unarmed, with no apparent intention to kill. But can a series of split-second decisions in a moment of crisis justify the ultimate punishment? And how do we reconcile Moore's version of events with the tragic outcome that left a family without their loved one? When Moore's case finally reached trial in 2001, troubling questions emerged about the fairness of the proceedings. Perhaps most striking was the composition of the jury itself. In Spartanburg County, where African Americans made up 20% of the population, not a single black juror was selected to decide Moore's fate. This disparity would later become a crucial point of contention in his appeals. The trial itself revealed significant concerns about the quality of Moore's legal representation. His current attorneys argue that he didn't receive the best possible defense, pointing to crucial evidence that wasn't properly analyzed or presented. The crime scene investigation, they contend, could have supported Moore's version of events, but these details never made it to the jury's ears. Despite the questions surrounding self-defense and the unplanned nature of the confrontation, the prosecution successfully pursued the death penalty. This decision has raised eyebrows among legal experts, especially when compared to other cases in the same jurisdiction. Consider that years later, the same prosecutor's office didn't seek capital punishment for Todd Kolhep, who was responsible for seven deaths, including a victim he tortured for days. The jury ultimately delivered their verdict, guilty, with a recommendation for death. But was this the result of seeing all the evidence, or did the limitations of Moore's defense team leave crucial gaps in the story? And how much weight should we give to the fact that Moore, unlike many death row inmates, had no intention to kill when he entered that store? These questions have haunted the case for over two decades, pushing it beyond a simple matter of guilt or innocence into a complex debate about justice, representation, and the arbitrary nature of capital punishment in our legal system. Behind the cold steel bars of South Carolina's death row, Richard Moore's story took an unexpected turn. What happens when a man facing death finds purpose in life? For more, the answer came through mentorship and a deep commitment to making amends for his past actions. Former prison director John Osmond, who witnessed Moore's transformation firsthand, describes him as a force for good within the prison walls. Despite the isolation at death row, Moore has become a spiritual guide and mentor to his fellow inmates. But what drives a man in his position to reach out and help others when facing his own mortality? The answer might lie in Moore's profound spiritual journey. 
As a born-again Christian, he's channeled his energy into supporting others, proving that even in the darkest corners of our justice system, hope can flourish. His influence has been so significant that prison officials believe his potential impact could be even greater if given the chance to interact with the general prison population. Perhaps most touching is Moore's dedication to maintaining bonds with his family. Through video calls, he stays connected with his children and now his grandchildren, creating moments of joy in an otherwise grim existence. His son Lindell speaks of a father who refuses to make excuses for his past actions, instead focusing on being a positive example to prevent others from following a similar path. What's remarkable about Moore's transformation is its authenticity. He's not just going through the motions or playing a role to earn sympathy. His daily choices, his consistent commitment to helping others, and his genuine remorse paint a picture of a man who's found meaning in serving others, even as he faces the ultimate punishment. Could this be the true measure of rehabilitation not just acknowledging past wrongs, but actively working to prevent future ones? Now, as the clock ticks closer to Moore's scheduled execution, an extraordinary clemency petition has emerged, filled with voices pleading for his life. But what makes this petition particularly compelling? More than 20 individuals have stepped forward, each sharing their unique perspective on why Moore deserves mercy. Among these voices are two jurors from his original trial, the very people who once voted for his death sentence. Even more remarkably, the judge who presided over his case has joined this chorus for clemency. What could have caused these key figures from his trial to reconsider their positions after all these years? The 42 pages of letters paint a portrait of a man who has touched countless lives. Six childhood friends, five relatives, and several former attorneys have all contributed their perspectives. But perhaps most telling is that these attorneys, despite being unable to save him from death row, still maintain contact with Moore, who continues to show concern for their families. What kind of person maintains such connections even in the face of death? In South Carolina's history, clemency in death penalty cases has been extraordinarily rare. In fact, since the U.S. Supreme Court reinstated capital punishment in 1976, not a single one of the 44 inmates executed in South Carolina has received clemency. The state stands alone in this regard. No other state has executed so many without granting mercy to anyone. Governor Henry McMaster now holds Moore's fate in his hands. As is customary, he's promised a thorough review of the petition, though his decision won't be announced until moments before the scheduled execution. The question that hangs in the air is whether this case, with its unprecedented support from such a diverse group of advocates, might finally break South Carolina's pattern of unwavering execution decisions. Consider the weight of former prison director Osmint's words in the petition. Despite being a supporter of capital punishment who has never advocated for another death row inmate, he believes Moore's potential to influence others positively is too valuable to extinguish. Could this testimony from someone who has overseen numerous executions be the key to swaying the governor's decision? This case forces us to confront some troubling questions about the application of capital punishment in our justice system. Consider this, Richard Moore entered that convenience store unarmed, with no intention to kill. Of all the inmates on South Carolina's death row, he's the only one whose crime began this way. Does this distinction matter when we're talking about the ultimate punishment? Even more striking is the comparison to the case of Todd Colheb. The same prosecutor's office that sought death for Moore opted not to pursue capital punishment for Colheb, who killed seven people and tortured one of his victims for days. How do we reconcile these dramatically different approaches to prosecution? What does this tell us about the consistency or lack thereof in how we apply the death penalty? The arbitrary nature of death penalty cases becomes even more apparent when we examine the racial dynamics at play. Moore's trial took place in a county where 20% of the population was black, yet not a single African American served on his jury. This disparity raises serious questions about the fundamental fairness of our capital punishment system. But perhaps the most compelling argument for reconsidering how we apply the death penalty comes from Moore's transformation behind bars. If our justice system is meant to both punish and rehabilitate, what do we make of cases where an inmate has demonstrated profound change? When someone becomes a positive influence on other inmates and maintains meaningful family connections, should this factor into decisions about their fate? 
the questions this case raises go far beyond Richard Moore himself. They challenge us to examine whether our current system truly reserves the death penalty for the worst of the worst, or if other factors including race, resources, and arbitrary decision-making play too large a role in determining who lives and who dies. Let's consider what message we send when we execute someone who has demonstrated the capacity for positive change. If Moore has indeed become a force for good within the prison system, capable of steering others away from violence, what do we lose by carrying out his execution? As we wrap up today's deep dive into Richard Moore's case, I can't help but wonder, what does justice truly look like in cases like these? Is it the finality of execution, or could it be found in allowing someone who's demonstrated profound change to continue making a positive impact, even from behind bars? Moore's story challenges our conventional understanding of redemption and punishment. From an unarmed man making a tragic decision in a convenience store, to a mentor and grandfather who's touched countless lives from death row it's a transformation that demands our attention and consideration. Whether Governor McMaster grants clemency or not, this case will undoubtedly leave its mark on South Carolina's criminal justice history. It forces us to grapple with difficult questions about mercy, justice, and the true purpose of our correctional system. What's your take on this complex case? Should redemption and rehabilitation play a larger role in our justice system? And at what point does mercy serve justice better than the ultimate punishment? If you're as fascinated by cases like these as I am, you'll want to check out our curated collection of true crime books in the description below. These works dive even deeper into similar cases that have shaped our criminal justice system. Join me tomorrow for another compelling story that challenges our understanding of crime and justice. We'll be examining a cold case that was cracked wide open by an unexpected discovery in the most unlikely of places. Until then, this is Sean Dupree, and you're listening to The Real Crime Diary. Hey listeners, welcome back to The Real Crime Diary. I'm your host, Sean Dupree. If you tuned in last time, we had a deep dive into the disturbing history of power abuse across different eras looking at the connection between dominance, control, and how it plays out even today. We touched on scandals from the past and compared them with some modern-day examples, showing how these patterns of abuse, unfortunately, persist. One of the most insightful tools we've explored to understand this is my book, Power, Pleasure, and Pain, A Study of Abuse Through Time. It's not just a historical account, but an interdisciplinary approach to understanding why this keeps happening. We draw from history, philosophy, and modern case studies to explain how figures like Dominique Pellico, Harvey Weinstein, and others have exploited their positions of power for their own gain, often protected by the very systems meant to stop them. Recap of Last Interaction In our last live stream, we discussed how libertinism, philosophically introduced by figures like Marquis de Sade, has shaped the way power and pleasure have been entangled throughout history. This concept ties directly into how figures like Weinstein operated, as we saw parallels between Desaad's fictional characters and the way powerful men manipulated their victims in real life. You guys had some amazing comments, asking how societal structures have allowed these behaviors to go unchecked for so long. It's a crucial question, and one that the book addresses deeply. Why this book is valuable. Now what's powerful about power, pleasure, and pain is its ability to break down these historical patterns and link them to the present. You're not just reading about ancient Rome or Enlightenment philosophy, you're seeing how these ideologies are alive today. The book uncovers how sexual violence and control have been systematically woven into the fabric of societies from ancient times right up to the modern era. It's about understanding not just the individual predators, but the systems that protect them whether it's in royal courts, religious institutions, or today's corporate and entertainment worlds. Through these historical lenses, we also explore movements like Hashtag Me Too that are beginning to dismantle these structures. The fight for justice is far from over, but as the book demonstrates, we are in the midst of a cultural shift where legal reforms are finally addressing these long-standing issues. It's more than a history lesson. It's a guide to understanding and supporting change today. What's next? If you want to dive deeper, I suggest picking up Power, Pleasure, and Pain, 
a study of abuse through time. It's available now, and trust me, it will change the way you think about power, pleasure, and control. We've even got some exclusive content coming up on the channel where we'll be exploring the book's case studies in even more detail, so stay tuned for that. And if you haven't yet, make sure you subscribe to The Real Crime Diary so you don't miss any updates. Let's keep this conversation going, because understanding the past is key to changing the future.